Well, greetings, brethren. It's a wonderful Sabbath. It's uh, basically after the Feast of First Fruits that we have celebrated last last week. Last weekend, that is, we had the uh, two Sabbaths in the row. We used the occasion to go uh, to one of the famous spa centers in Serbia. We have ordained a couple of deacons. So we have Slobodan Balovic and Aleksandar Stanisavljevic now as our deacons who will be there to serve you to the best of their possibilities and abilities. So please do not uh, refrain from asking them for help. Anyway, they're, yes, they're, they're young. Alexander is younger, but Alexander has a position of a receptionist at a very famous hotel in Serbia. He lives in the capital of Serbia, where millions of people pass every year due to tourism, mostly. Uh, while Slobodan Balovic has got very rich experience with uh, Greek language, for example, very rich experience with some other things that are very useful when it comes to psychological difficulties and other things that might be of interest to, especially you younger people. So in that case, we have got now a stronger leadership positions here in Serbia. So if something would happen to me, thankfully, there are people who can continue and further this work of God. Now, of course, at the same time, yes, since this is our first service after a while in English, I do plan to ordain, if not me, then somebody else, Jamie Stoneham in, in Australia as a deacon because we do need, desperately need, a leadership there. At the same time, I'm now working with Randy Fries that, so that through Philip Shields, our friend, we can have Andre Nelson ordain a deacon and... Uh, Terry Nelson ordained elders. I'm speaking about people who have shown willing attitude to serve others, who have shown in their lives and in their example, their example is of service. And I'm very, indeed, very thankful that I'm associated now with all of you in the same church organization, brethren, with such people who have shown that willingness to serve others, willingness to sacrifice their own whatever personal positions in order for the truth. We keep being accused, and yes, uh, the, the, the lies keep being spread <laughs> all the time, especially from that black black continent region. But uh, I'm confident that God is going to work it all out, and I think many will be ashamed. When all things come and be revealed, many will be ashamed of what they did not know, what they did not hear, what they did not believe. And at the same time, we can live at a total peace. I plan also to make inaugural speech on 15th of July. It's the Sabbath prior to the 16th of July. Now, you may wonder why 16th of July is so important. Well, on 16th of July, brethren, we founded the Hope of Israel Library here. Uh, and now we are part of the Hope of Israel Worldwide Church of God. What a wonderful thing. So um, at the same time, 16th of January was the anniversary when I returned to Serbia after my turmoil spiritual life at Ambassador uh, and after I organized Student Underground and uh, after we have uh, struggled to uh, make you know things survive and, and continue to preach the truth and be uh, and be continuation of what was the good work during the life of Herbert W. Armstrong. So therefore I thought that uh, 16th of July that would be Sunday, but 15th of July would be just a uh, Sabbath prior to that. And I thought on that 15th of July I should make inaugural speech. If you have anything that you would love to add, if you want me anything to, to, to say in particular, please feel free uh, I don't know what can I say in that inaugural speech really other than just to outline why we became Hope of Israel and just want to make that encouraging message and uh, in a kind of a celebratory message. Well, we could be thankful to God because we have got to know one another, all of us. Uh, in these various circumstances, we should be very grateful for that. And perhaps uh, that wouldn't have happened unless... Unless God has uh, has made things work out the way he did. Because we know that all things work out for good for those who love God. And I'm convinced that all of you here love God very much. Hopefully we love God even above our own lives. 
And therefore, yes, indeed, I'm also confident, like Randy says, it will reach many and be the continuation of the true Philadelphian remnant. I'm convinced about that. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. We are small but mighty. Just look at the accomplishments over the past few months. Yes, Randy says, and I completely agree with him. We've accomplished so much when you realize how many locations we have we have reached. But it's not only the locations. It's the quality of people we have. Uh, the quality of all of us gathered here, brethren. It's also a wonderful blessing we have. Don't, don't you ever diminish and don't you ever forget that we have a wonderful blessing that we enjoy confidence of, uh, uh, of a government, of a, of a nation, in this case as a nation of Malawi. You know, we have demonstrated to that government, so to the very top leadership of a country, that we are truly Christians, that we truly want to help those people, that we truly want to preach the gospel, of, that we are not going to tolerate lawless and sinful individuals who have been the same individual I, I've noticed again in this his latest report he keeps lying all the time and 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 all you know and then you come to realize we were associated with people in Africa who are just embroiled in lies all of their life is lies all of their all of their uh, reports are lies all of their uh, all of their uh, requests and stuff are based on personal gain so all that is coming from 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 that continent of course going to californian headquarters it's all lies it's lies and it's corruption and it's so terrible thankfully we're out of that thankfully we're not associated with that anymore but thankfully also we have we enjoy the uh, wonderful confidence of of the of the government of malawi and i'm so grateful that we have our friend forster who is there and uh, his eyes are constantly watchful and whatever happens on the soil of Malawi, as far as church matters are concerned, we're being informed right away, truthfully and uh, and, we con uh, and, and, and and constantly being informed about all the various lies and manipulations that these these these, these crooked people in Africa are doing. In any case, I wanted to tell tell you about brethren to speak about the subject of Christian calling because. Um, Many people have no clue that we are all here called, that Christ is the one who chose us. We didn't choose him. And here we are now in hope of Israel, bound by the same hope and the same faith and the same love. And you know, when you receive sometimes the invitations to any, for example, for a wedding ceremony, it says, you know, there is an invitation card and it says, you are cordially invited to attend whatever it could be a formal dance party it could be a birthday it could be wedding wedding party whatever but it's always a card beautifully printed and goes on to describe the elegant and enjoyable event to which you are invited now uh, you know a simple invitation party it's really easy for us to understand but many people today do not understand and perhaps even those who have come into contact with God's church do not really understand how God invites how God calls those he wants into his church. Yes, you heard me well. He invites those he wants into his church. It's not something that we can volunteer for. Many people do not understand the Christian calling. And we, being Christians, I hope that we will understand it. And thankfully, the Ambassador College was a very useful institution in those days, in the last century. And thankfully, there are many very good materials that have been left as a legacy and uh, just before I for example before I ordained our, our, our deacons I provided them with uh, materials that were printed back in those days in the 70s 60s uh, just to give them a clue what the serving of God's people implies and so that they would just be prepared for that ministry and um, Again, there are very subtle lectures for ambassador. For example, the um, uh, the awareness of the house of Israel and the identity of the house of Israel today, and so on and so forth. Also today, we have various branches of the Church of God, and uh, as you know, as Hope of Israel, we are not closed-minded, and we are not we are not kind of exclusive, thinking that we are the only ones who know everything the best. Of course not, brethren. Uh, we had to separate and go our own way because we had to separate from the uh, curse of what was going on in the organization we belong to. But that doesn't mean that we do not understand and do not appreciate the brethren 
all over the world in various branches of the Church of God and thankfully there are many of those many of them some of them are very educated some of them are veteran um, ministers and so on and so forth so uh, we use their wisdom as well we we, we, we we use what they have to produce because all of that is for the benefits of the church it says that in uh, today in Serbia we, we, we discussed about that that we are all members of one body and that God has given to all of us various gifts for the benefits of all and that's exactly why how we are to be behaving and uh, as you know I'm very keen about reverting the process of scattering the process of fragmentation scattering of God's people that really deeply hurts me and I've vowed when I was ordained as an elder in the Church of God I vowed to God and I, 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 I pleaded with God and vowed to God and asked God to use me to revert this process of fragmentation and 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 and, and uh, division within the body of Christ so the body of Christ is div divided it is fra fractured brethren mostly because of various personal vanities but also because of various circumstances that have affected God's church in the last century towards the end of the last century as well as during this century but uh, one vital factor that played in the fragmentation of God's church has always been personal vanity and people unwilling to cooperate one with other people willing to be leaders and to have their followers and all of that as you probably know I'm not the person who suffers from that I'm not a person who just uh, wants to have followers I want to be an associated with honest people people who love God and people who are willing to uh, do whatever is within their power to spread the gospel message I know none of you is perfect I'm not perfect myself either but certainly I'm always willing for cooperation I'm always willing for God's people to see unity remember the psalm was it Psalm 133 or something how how uh, we have a hymn how beautiful how pleasant for brethren to dwell together in unity so David did tell remember like dun, 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 dun. so unity it's so pleasant and blessed thing and I, and I know I'm not I'm not uh, naive to think that it will happen perhaps in in this dispensation of God's church but one of these days it will have to be accomplished and I certainly want to be part of that success and I believe you all want to be part of that success so in the meantime we'll be working for that success now back to the subject people do not understand the Christian calling they, that is they do not understand whom God calls or how God calls people or why such a lack of understanding is saddening for those that God now makes the heirs of salvation and they're commanded as it says in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1 to walk worthy of their calling and in 2nd Peter chapter 1 verse 10 they're called to make their calling sure so brethren that refers to us okay so we are basically we are called by God as heirs of salvation we're commanded to walk worthy of our calling and we're commanded to make our calling sure so that then we can be elected and then that we can be faithful to the end and one of these Sabbaths we're going to be speaking about the uh, what does it mean to uh, to endure to the end and then to see and meet our Savior as he returns and then to become the co-workers or the co-rulers with him in the kingdom of God and if any time if any time you have doubt what is our future destiny just please remember revelation 20 when when uh, john whom the revelation was given by jesus christ when john saw thrones and those who were beheaded for the word of god and for the testimony of jesus were given those thrones to sit on them and the judgment it says in some translations like in one serbian translation it says judgment was given to them to judge for 1000 years so there is no doubt of what is our destiny and what is the destiny of the saved it's not to be harping harping uh, whatever harping guitars and harps or whatever harping things on in heaven and and praising endlessly their lord that's a lovely thing but it will be a bit a bit you know a bit boring after a while 
But the Lord, the same very God of Israel, has uh, laid out the plan of salvation for all humankind. And right now, as we have celebrated a week ago, he is working with the first fruits of salvation, preparing them to help him lead to salvation the rest of mankind when the right time comes. And the right time will come when Jesus Christ returns. Then later, in the uh, second resurrection, there will be right time for all those who never experience and who were who died before the return of jesus christ there'll be billions of people there brethren in any case the thing is so how can we do how can we walk worthy of our calling and how can we make sure that our calling sure if we don't understand what our calling is and yet we find we don't need to remain in darkness about this vital and foundational subject because the Bible teaching is very plain. It's plain, but of course, as you know, the Bible is a somewhat coded book and uh, it's not always easy to understand the Bible. But um, once we decode its message, then we can put together all of those pieces of information and we behold absolutely a stunning, amazing picture. You see, brethren, when God calls a person, he invites that person into his church to help the church perform its great commission of preaching the gospel to the world as we know in Matthew 24 14 this gospel will be preached to all the world and then the end will come and also another reason why God calls a person is to prepare that person to rule with Jesus Christ and teach God's way in the world tomorrow as we used to call the coming kingdom of God the world tomorrow and you might remember some of you, the world tomorrow, ladies and gentlemen, Herbert Dominic Armstrong. So the world tomorrow, that's how we used to call the, uh, the the millennium or the coming kingdom. Now, with Matthew 24, 14, you are well familiar. So that's why first reason why God calls somebody. So to perform that great commission of preaching the gospel. And the second one is to rule with Christ and teach God's way in the world to come. Uh, please go to Revelation. I've already made reference to Revelation. But you may wish to uh, see it, and you may wish that we read it from, from the Bible, indeed. Revelation, let's go to chapter 2 and chapter 3. In chapter 2 and 3, as you know, there is the message of Jesus Christ to all seven churches on X, uh, or on former uh, male root, that was in Asia Minor. So let's go to Revelation chapter 2 and verse should be I think verse should be 26 A Revelation chapter 2 and let's see verse I think verse 26 would be the message to Tyatari if I'm not from if I'm not mistaken yes Revelation 2 26 it says and he that overcomes and keeps my works unto the end in other words he that endures to the end to him and to her of course Will I give power over the nations? Brethren, what is power over the nations? But, you know, to rule over the nations. And he shall, look at verse 27, he shall rule them with the rod of iron, meaning that he's not going to be smashing them with the rod of iron. It's a symbolism of discipline that people need to be subjected to in order to follow the right path. He shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers not broken literally, but broken, you know, symbolically, even as I received of my Father. And then in uh, Revelation chapter 3, and verse should be 21, it's a famous message to the last generation of the Church of God, to the Laodiceans. And to the Laodiceans, it's again the encouragement to, to be overcomers. To him that overcomes... Will I grant to sit with me into my throne, even as I also overcame, and I am set down with my Father in his throne? So, this is, you might say, the reward of the saved. And uh, that is the main purpose for being called brethren now, to prepare to rule with Christ, and to also help the church perform its great commission. Now, a person called at this time is also one of the relatively few to whom God is now offering the chance to suffer salvation. So that doesn't mean that, you know, if we have few members in Malawi and few members in Serbia, that that's the end of the story. All the rest are doomed to destruction. No, not at all. 
Not at all. We understand that God has a plan, a marvelous plan working out, and right now, the part of that plan, the first stage of salvation is called in the first roots for these two main purposes. The second stage will be after Christ returns to open up the gate of salvation, gates of salvation to all humankind that survived. And the third one, all those who died and never were able to understand God's truth. Perhaps they heard it, but they were never really, their minds were not open to understand it. They will come back to life and they'll be given 1,000, they'll be given, sorry, 100 year, 1,000 year will be preparing the earth for all those billions of people to come back to life. And then once they come, they'll be given, let's say, an average or sort of average human lifespan, which will be 100 years, according to Isaiah chapter 65. And then they will be able in those 100 years to really repent, change their ways and prove by actions that they want to have eternal life. And then that will be the third and the last stage of salvation. So God has merciful plan he is a just god nobody will be left out and if you ever wondered you know sometimes i just play with protestants or even the sabbath keeping protestants and i say to them okay i say to according to their to your theology all those who never received christ who don't receive christ in their hearts will be lost is that true they say yes it's true okay i said in that case now you tell me how could aborted children who are never born to life who never grew up who are never allowed to live let alone receive christ in their hearts how can they be saved what will be happen? what will happen to them and of course all those protestants have no response have no answer to that very vital question well i said that's exactly where it comes into the play, the knowledge about the perfect plan of God, brethren, because all of those wonderful children who were aborted will come back in the second resurrection. They'll be given chance to grow up. They'll be given chance to accept true Jesus Christ. They'll be given chance to change their life, to have their lives changed and, 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 and be in harmony with God. And they will be given the right, just chance. They'll be given back to their parents after all. So they can grow up and then those parents, those parents could raise them and then they'll be given, as you see, a, a right and just chance to, uh, to grow up and to become God beings. Because God is not a trinity, God is not a unity. God is a family. The word Elohim is the, um, uh, how can I say that, Singular, singularity of, of plurality. Which means God is a family into which limitless, endless number of God beings can be born into. And the same goes for everything else. For all the children who died in these wars, or because of famine, and because of all kinds of human terrible injustices, brethren, all they will come back in the second resurrection, those innocent, lovely children, and they'll be able to grow up, and they'll be able to live forever. That's a wonderful, wonderful truth. But the Protestantism has no clue about it. The Protestantism offers no hope, of salvation for those children and many others after all now we are just relatively small number of people being called now it's a privilege oh yes indeed but brethren you should keep in mind that god alone decides who shall be called by opening a person's mind to understand his truth and that's exactly what i was troubled by some phenomena in our former church affiliation you know and then all of a sudden you hear oh there is a congregation in i don't know x country and i don't know this congregation used to be seventh day adventist now they're part of us or i don't know in this in that country uh we have re oh we have received requests for these three congregations to join us as so, brethren people cannot volunteer to join god's church <laughs> please understand that and even worse, we would just accept all those people without any question. You know, what they understand, uh, who baptized them, did they really repent, what they repented of. You know, and, and there was, then we had a very, very interesting, interesting phenomenon that, you know, somebody was baptized or immersed in a Protestant religion. And then later when he comes to our former affiliation, uh, 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 a minister just laid hands on him and I wouldn't do that brethren if you ask me because to repent you have to know what to repent of now perhaps that person before you know his repentance didn't know that he had to repent of keeping keeping pagan holidays they have nothing to do with Christ so uh, it was just 
without any critical thinking or, 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 or consideration that people are just being admitted into the church fellowship and yet we had no idea where they came from what doctrines did they learn before prior to their coming to, to, to our fellowship we had no idea who they were who baptized them and 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 and, and simply what is in their minds you know quite often I would just uh, forgive me if I'm a bit uh, if I'm a bit overbearing with with remembering some of past experience but I think it's good for 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 you to understand your calling uh, sometimes you know I would suggest that we make some survey anonymous survey to see what people did and did not understand I was thinking even about making such survey with a ministry and we'll be doing that by the way I've already I've already cautioned the the, the ministers in Africa especially those in Kenya who want to be joining with us, that there will be some surveys. Not because we want to catch them in, in error and whatever, but we want to need, we need to understand what they may not be understanding. You know, Africa per se is a, is a world for itself. It's a very insulated kind of area where people just are mostly directed to their own little lives. Many of them don't even have a TV set, you know, you know, because sometimes even through TV we could just get to know the world around us a bit more or other countries. But these people, many of them, I realized, didn't have even TV. So when I would appear in a car or something, there was this, the children would especially get very worked up and, you know, oh, muzungu, muzungu, you know, the white man. And then they would just run after you and then they would just, you know, run after me just to see the white man. And uh, when I was sitting in a region in Kenya called Mau Mau, uh, I could see children, you know, uh, touching touching my skin <laughs> because it was white. Some of them were touching my hair because they've got very curly and strong kind of strong hair. Hair as mine is very kind of uh, mine is like a straw. I was uh, <laughs> I always compare my <laughs> my hairstyle with a straw. It's very 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 unique, uh, even in, even in the white world. So, you know, they would be touching my hair, touching my skin, you know, they were just, they were just so interested. It was just, it was to them, it's a phenomena. So, because it's, it's you know, it, it's a world uh, directed to itself. They don't have much contact, it seems, with the, with, the, with the outside world. So then, sometimes you cannot understand the Bible unless you have some history background, you know. For example, how can you understand those seven, seven church eras? How can you understand the seven... Uh, uh, seven hills on which the 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 the, 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 uh, the fornicating woman sits. Uh, how can you understand the Rome? How can you understand some things that Constantine the Great did? Unless you understand the history. Speaking of Constantine the Great, oh my friends, today, right now, today it's the Sabbath, but today is the day that the Serbian Orthodox Church here set apart to celebrate this day as the Constantine's Day. Which of course was a one very good uh, occasion for me to lambast once again his his pagan disgusting doctrines. Uh, I didn't pay much attention to that. My sermon today in Serbian was about uh, each one of us being members, many members, but of one body, body of Christ, in which I then explained what the phenomenon of the church really is. It's a spiritual organism made up of those with whom Holy Spirit is working and uh, that's a completely different idea from what Constantine uh, uh, imposed on this world as a church uh, and what the church represents. So uh, today is a Constantine's day and we were reminded of that and uh, I'm working still on a booklet on Constantine and original Christianity which I hope to have translated, uh, it'll be in Serbian of course because he was born in Serbia by the way, but uh, and I'm, I'm ashamed, I was deeply ashamed, I have to admit to you, of how much I did not know about Constantine and his role in subverting the true Christianity. Uh, the church did mention it here and there, but it was never really, never really dawned on me how important this subject is. So I'm still working, uh, adding a little bit of sources, Serbian sources to that booklet so that the people would not say, oh, you wrote about concept, but you didn't read this book and that book and stuff. A lot of those books are basically rubbish, brethren, because they, what they do, they just celebrate his, the fact that he gave Christianity uh, equal rights in the Roman Empire and nothing more than that. 
the, 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 the Serbian historians, they just point out that he is edict of milan and that's about it you know and then and that's that's a heroism so as somebody said last last weekend as we kept the pentacle somebody said isn't that wonderful uh he he gave equal rights to the christians and then the serbian people uh, uh deified him basically and they call him a saint and he's not only a saint today is the day he's not only a saint but uh, he's equal Equally saying, equally, uh, equally holy as the apostles. He is equal to the apostles when it comes to sainthood. Could you believe that, brother? What a blasphemy, terrible blasphemy. But today is that the Serbian Orthodox Church keeps that day in honor of Constantine the Great. And I hope, and again, you see, I'm just giving you this as an example that you need to know some background to some things. This is the man, I'm speaking about the man who, who basically annulled. The, uh, the, the the most solemn occasion for all Christians, the the, the New Testament Passover, brethren, because remember, Jesus Christ prior to his death, prior to being arrested, changed the Old Testament Passover symbols. No longer was the lamb and 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 and, and uh, marking the the doorposts with lamb's blood. Now it was the it was now the uh, unleavened bread and wine as symbols of his body and blood being spilled for us and his body being broken for us and forgiveness of our sins you know that is so important subject so vital but brethren i have to admit to you a few years ago i wouldn't have known that this horrible criminal called constantine the great did that and then i realized after a while look many of our brethren have no clue about him then i thought look but many of other sabbath keepers have no clue about him then I thought to myself, wait a second. The most people who are most aware of him are, you wouldn't believe, the, 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 the Messianic Jews and those Messianic Jewish circles. But even they have no idea to what extent to what extent this man is a criminal, spiritual criminal. So I said to myself, hey, wait a second. He was born in my country. Wait a second. I have to write something about him. First of all, to inform my kinsmen, and then later to inform the rest of the world. So, brethren, we are having the Constantine and Origin Christianity a booklet on the way. It'll be it'll be soon finished, and then we'll be working to have it to have it published and and, and published on, on 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 internet, brethren, in all the languages. I would need we need to witness to the whole world about the crimes against God and against God's word that Constantine did. He dared that pagan with his with his title Pontifex Maximus that was succeeded by the Roman uh, by the Roman popes. He dared, brethren, to mess up with God's law. He dared to change God's law. Remember, there was this. Remember that prophecy in Daniel that the beast will be looking to change the uh, the, the times and seasons. He did it, brethren. And what he did is the precursor of the coming European dictator whom we are waiting. He is being brewed in, 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 in Middle East. The, the, the Serbian national TV almost every month brings us the latest updates, the news from the Middle East. Brethren, Israel and Iran are basically in, 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 in race. In race of developing all kinds of means and weapons, hoping, you know, to hoping to outsmart the other side and iran has already vowed to israel that because of their preventive strikes airstrikes is iran said it is going to retaliate one day why am, I, why am i mentioning this well because you know once the middle east conflict comes into the fore we're going to see europe being involved all of a sudden as a peacemaker oh could you believe that Bestial Europe is a peacemaker, yeah, sure. And then we will see the man who will be the first beast of Revelation 13, who will be the Roman, the Roman uh, European, German of German origin, European, European peacemaker, who will eventually become the president of the United Europe. And then we know that he is the first beast. No question about that, brethren. And yes, you already know who I think it will be, but if it's not him, I'm going to apologize to all of you. Nobody's perfect, so neither am I. But he, as far as I know, 
you know, I'm talking about Karl Theodor zu Gutenberg. Brethren, he, as far as I can see, is the best candidate that Germany has for that position. His career, his uh, command of English language, his uh, charisma, you might say, just makes me feel that he most likely is the one. If he is not the one, I'll apologize, but we'll know who is the one when he appears. Now, anyway, back to the calling. Forgive me that I'm perhaps mixing in all of these other subjects, but yes, this is the first <laughs> English message, as Jamie noted, you know, of Israel worldwide. I didn't, didn't think about it really at all, but it's true. Um, let me go back to the calling. What is the usual teachings of this world? Well, brethren, most professing Christians feel that God is now calling everybody to salvation. No. Others think that God calls to salvation those who wish to be called or those who seek to be called by deciding to give their hearts to the Lord. No, brethren. Still others feel that God must surely call only the best society has got to offer. The good people, under quotation mark, the good people who try to obey God as they see him. A few feel that a person has not been called unless he has some type of special religious experience, such as speaking in tongues, for example. And certain preachers must feel that they have the power to call people since they tell people at those tent meetings in the Western world to come forward and profess Christ. As you can just well guess, brethren, the answer to all of those ideas of the world is no. And amazingly, all these common teachings and impressions are proven false. They're proven false by the Bible. Now, what is the Bible teaching? Well, although many people use the biblical expression and profess to have been called, like it has been two years since I was called to the Lord, well, few have ever stopped to realize and understand what they are saying. The New Testament was written in Greek, and the English is only... A translation that we have. Nonetheless, the English word call well reflects the process described in the Bible. To be called is to be invited or hailed by God, much as a person might telephone a group of friends and invite them to a party. So if I telephone you over the over Skype now and I invite you to a party, online party and offline party, but then that's what it means to be called. There is a phone Ring, 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 ring. Hello. Oh, hi. Hi, John. This is God of Israel. I'm calling you to my church. Oh, what a shock. <laughs> you have illustration in, uh, in the Gospel of Matthew. In the Gospel of Matthew 22. And uh, it is important that basically it's uh, the parable of the wedding feast. Now, the thing is, brethren, that... Uh, the kingdom of heaven, Christ says in this parable, is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding. Uh, I'm reading now verse 2 and 3. So the kingdom of heaven, well, that was verse 2. And then verse 3 says, And he sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. They would not come. And again, verse 4, he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light, and light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entered them spitefully and slew them. When the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then says, verse 8, he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go therefore into the highways, and as many as you shall find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways 
and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. Anyway, we can stop right there. But in any case, you see, it's wedding. And I'll, re I'll remind you, brethren, what is the wedding? The wedding ceremony of Jesus Christ. It's right there in Revelation. Brethren, I've committed in these, well, now several months, but basically whole, this whole year, I've committed myself to be explaining to the Serbian congregation the vision that we need to have. Because I've noticed that in spite of the zeal and stuff, there is something that there was lacking, badly lacking in the Serbian congregation, and that's vision. And we know from Proverbs 29, verse 18, that without vision, people perish. We're people of God that we must not perish. So in the last month, several months, I've been telling them various things that and today I quoted them that uh, very proverb, and I explain it once again to them. We need to have better vision. One of the parts of the vision that we need to have is that we are going to marry Jesus Christ. We are the bride of Jesus Christ. What kind of bride will Jesus marry? Well, we'll be talking about that as well, hopefully in the months to come. And I hope in the hope of Israel, Worldwide Church of God, I do want us to have a vision. Why? Well, because at various occasions, when I corresponded or when I discussed things with various people, they told me something that has really stuck with me to this day. They said to me, the reason why you're still faithful and you're still around is because you have a vision. A vision about the kingdom of God, they would add. And then I was thinking later, well, wait a second, yes. The life is now more, much more difficult than when I was younger. But if vision kept me through and saw me through all of these various trials, and brethren, trials in my life were not a few, and if that vision has given me strength to endure through all of these, through all of these years, well, then that same vision should and could and will help anybody else. We need to have that vision, but in part of the vision, we are the bride of Christ. And yes, shockingly to many of you, perhaps, we are going to be married to Jesus Christ at his return. That's the wedding ceremony. Remember from Revelation, was it chapter, chapter 11, I think. So, uh, the kingdom of heaven is like this certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and then he sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding. Quite plainly then, brethren, God's calling is an invitation. It's not something you can volunteer for. In Galatians 1, Verse 6, it says it is a calling, an invitation to the grace of Christ. Galatians 1, 6. And I'm reading King James Version, Old King James Version. Forgive me. It's not always understandable, but okay. But it's... Uh, it's the Old King... It's still the, <laughs> the... Perhaps the earliest Bible you have in English. Galatians 1, 6. I marvel that you so soon are removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, because the Galatians were having problem with circumcision. That's altogether another subject. So they were called, you know, uh, they were called to grace, grace by, by Christ. Then if you take a look at First Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it says that the calling we have received from God is calling from darkness to light. 1 Peter 2.9 Alright, here is 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9 it says But ye are also a chosen generation a royal priesthood a holy nation a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light 
So, in summary, we can say being called means that one is invited to be a member of God's church with all the responsibilities that entails and the hope of salvation. And that's why, you see, I think in Hope of Israel we'll be very careful with people who just want to like, you know, as a congregation, they want to join us, they want to join Hope of Israel and stuff. There are some people who just insist about it. Well, forget about it, you know. We need to know whether you're called. People need to be examining themselves and then, and, 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 you know. And they need to understand that being called means that you're invited to be a member of God's church. And you're being invited by God. I cannot invite you. We cannot. We don't go around inviting anybody. Oh, come to the... That's what some people in, 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 in Africa think. Because, you know, they pay attention to the numbers. You know, it's numbers that they're obsessed with. You know, numbers of people and stuff. And they think that we're obsessed with the same thing when we are not. We don't care about the numbers. You know, every time you care about the numbers, it's a, it's, it's a recipe for disaster. Every time in the church when people think how much would return with how much they, for example, invest, you know, with, with, with magazines and stuff, they would be trying to project how many people might respond and how many people might respond uh, to a TV program by calling calling the church office. And every time people played with, 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 with numbers, brethren, every time they were obsessed with numbers, that was the recipe for disaster. And that's how some people think that we are now obsessed with numbers and we just want as many numbers to come with us and stuff no they are wrong brethren they are wrong god is the one who cares about the numbers not us not us absolutely not us none of us can volunteer for god's church it's a calling from god the greek word that is translated church in the new testament is actually ecclesia, which literally means called out once. And hence, when we are recalled, we are called, we become part of the called out once. That is the church. That is the church, and there is nothing else that is the church. And you might have thousands of people sitting there. If they're not called out once, if God hasn't called them in vain, you might be having millions of people in that church. Who cares, brethren? Who cares? People have to be called by God. And here is another important point that I want to stress. The common teaching that God is calling all now, that is that He is now trying to save the world, is utterly false. Absolutely false. When asked, when asked by His disciples why He spoke in riddles or parables, Jesus said, "In this is in Matthew 13, 11, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. It has not been given. And obviously by behavior of some in our former church affiliation, brethren, obviously that it was not given to them, obviously, to understand and to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Oh, they're just wonderful businessmen, you know. And we were laughing here in Serbia one day, and we were considering their ways. And uh, one of our members came up with 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 a saying: "One building, several several signs." So, you know, as a good businessman, they would just have oh, all the signs ready. So, if if they now profess their Baptist, they would just have a sign that they would just put at their church buildings, Baptist Church of whatever. Uh, welcome, you know, perhaps then they would change to being a Methodist or Church of God, Seventh Day, Jerusalem, or this, that, and the other brethren. We just, we just had all kinds of things happening that are just completely wrong. But to all of our pleas, the response of the leadership was that we are spreading rumors that we are tail bearers and all of that horrible things. And when we said, when the, 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 the most amazing thing it was when we said that the, our former church affiliation was not registered in the country of Malawi. And brethren, we knew that because, it, but it's amazing. No, we were told that now we are spending lies, we're telling lies. It's not truth. But how can it not be truth when we have the, the context with the highest 
officials in the government of Malawi. And we thus have the access, just like the whole world, because the Malawian government has made the uh, registra registrator of their businesses available to all the world. But even without that, we do have a friend in a high position there who can always check it for us. We asked this friend three times to check, and our former church affiliation was not. But now I read in this letter to the brethren that came out two days ago, for some reason they still send it to me, I don't know why, that, oh yes, there's still formalities now being done in Malawi, and soon it should be it should be all registered and whatever. Well, brethren, they can lie, they can lie to whomever they want to, but they cannot lie to us because we always have a confidential, wonderful contact in Malawi, our friend Forster, who can always check all the things for us. And once again, uh, you would never expect that Mr. Armstrong, when he was alive, he with some uh, uh, world officials, he was very close uh, to Israeli Prime Minister Sharon, uh, what was his name? I can't remember now his name. He was a good friend to them. He was a great friend to the Egyptian President Sadat, who was killed who was killed or assassinated, and uh, I remember reading how Mr. Trans was deeply affected by that. He was very, very good friend with him. He was, uh, he was a good friend with with with, with the, the, the Queen of, of of Thailand, and he would always point out the Queen of Thailand as as a wonderful example of a virtuous woman, even though she was the uh, the queen, the uh, heir to the Thai throne. She would never publish any decision and make without consulting with her husband. And Miss Ramsey would point out that as as a wonderful virtue of a virtuous woman that yes, she has got she's smart, she's uh, she's capable, but she understands that she is now under the leadership of her husband, and he would take it always out as a good example. And I remember reading somewhere when she came after his death, I think. Uh, to Ambassador Founder, to Ambassador Hall, she asked for a certain gift that she presented to him. She wanted to make sure that the gift was still there. And even to this day, in Thailand, there are some former Ambassador College students who have started a some kind of Ambassador College there. And this is very significant because uh, there is one tribe in that part of the world, Karen tribe, K-A-R-E-N tribe, and from what I've gathered from my friend Margot from Australia, uh, that tribe dis uh, uh, displays a lot of characteristics of the lost tribes of Israel. My friend Margot Crossing from Australia is a researcher. She has been researching about the lost tribes in, Austra in, uh, in Australia. Not in Australia, she's from Australia, but in, uh, in Asia. Brethren, you would not believe the findings in Asia. You would not believe uh, the number of individuals, the number of various tribes in Asia who claim to be descendants of the lost tribes of Israel. Uh, the, but the point was that uh, many of those who are from the current tribe attend that ambassador in Thailand. But our friends in Thailand, when they, if they want to visit, say, the royal palace, when they approach the gates, the guards uh, step aside immediately and automatically without asking for any identity, without asking them any question. They just step aside and our friends can enter into the royal palace without being questioned. And that shows you how much appreciation the royal family of Thailand has got for Mr. Armstrong, the man whose continuation we also are. And isn't that marvelous? I find it so wonderful that such a confidence, such a great confidence we have with the government of Malawi. And do you think it's by a chance that the first country in the world where we got registered is Malawi? Do you think it's that just by a chance that we, uh, you know, that we have such a wonderful help of that government? No, of course not. And yes, indeed, we want to cooperate. Every government in the world that wants to do something good for their people, for their citizens, Anything good, of course, we'll cooperate with the government. It's not forbidden. We are not to be voting. We are not to be involved in political parties. We are not to be involved in political struggles. No. No. However, as it says in Romans 13, we can cooperate with the government. 
we can even work for the government or a government it's not wrong the wrong thing would be to be participating in tarnishing ourselves in terrible political campaigns but to do good and to be even praised by a government for doing good there's nothing wrong we as Christians are praised by a Malawian government that's quite something really in any case back to our calling so uh, the disciples had been called to know the truth as it says it was given to them but the others brethren had not been called and this is not to say that the others will never be called of course just that they will not be called in this era or this lifetime but God has a perfect plan and there is nothing for us that we should be worried about those who are called now a relative few are called to help preach the gospel as a witness Matthew 24 14 of course and to prepare to be teachers and rulers in the world tomorrow under Christ when God will begin to call humanity as a whole if you don't understand that please go and yeah, well mark this very verse in Revelation 5 10 Revelation 5 10 it's a verse that needs to be marked because people have all kinds of ideas about uh, about going to heaven and I don't know doing whatever doing it in heaven but the Revelation 5 10 brethren is very clear and has made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth as clear as it can be we shall reign on the earth we shall reign in heaven what shall we learn what shall we be reigning in heaven over what over the angels why should we in the third heaven there is God's throne so why, what, what do we need there God has got all the serving angels serving spirits there we shall be serving we shall be ruling on the earth exactly absolutely God is calling God calling is in part an invitation to salvation now with his church so the question is now who then are now being called well Christ makes that answer very clear in uh, John 6 44 so he surely to the astonishment of the religious teachers of this world Christ says John 6 44 no one can come to me no one be that one in Kenya Malawi no one Serbia Europe Asia North America you name it but no one can come to me that is no one is invited or called unless the father who sent me draws him so the father draws us to true 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 Jesus Christ and that's how we get called no one can be called unless God himself decides to call him and her brethren there's nothing you can do to be calling your relatives and whatever and there's a good reason for that but let's let me not spend any more time with that no one brethren and astoundingly this means that God does not call everyone not those who wish to be nor those who try to be nor those who are t talked into joining churches by well-intentioned but misguided preachers nor just the good so-called good among the people but then rather God calls those he decides to call for his own reasons please get it and all those various congregations that just popped out somewhere or nowhere I want them we want to join you in your church no no you cannot join us God can join you to the church but you have to think about your calling what you think what you believe what is your background is your mind open to understand the truth or not notice how Paul states it in Romans 9 where he discusses this precise topic Romans 9 verse 16 so then it it meaning one's calling it is not of him who wills in other words he who wants to be called nor of him who runs he who even tries in his own way but of God who shows mercy Paul is not saying those not now called will not be saved only that their chance for salvation is not is not in this age but later still we cannot help but wonder upon what God bases his decision to call or not to call a certain person God does state certain qualifications and gives some examples from which we can glean answers brethren the most poignant of scripture of scriptures on this question is first Corinthians chapter 1 verse 26 and beyond 
Paul says, 1 Corinthians 1, 26, For you see your calling, brethren, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty, and the base things, and the things which are despised, and the things which are not. Do you get it, brethren? We cannot volunteer. We cannot say, oh, I want to find Christ. Do you hear me out? And mostly when I said to the church members here in Serbia, I said, brethren, when you were seeking God, you were looking, all of your ideas about God are wrong. You thought that God must be a, an elderly man with a long, long, long gray beard. You thought God must be some stern, stern, horrible deity waiting to punish you. You thought God was Trinity. You thought God was this, that, and the other brethren. And all of your ideas were wrong, 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 wrong. God is totally different of what we think of him to be before we are called. And the same is about coming to the church. No, you can you can come into the church physically and sit in the church and you can be thousands of you in the church sitting like that. But what does it mean? What does it mean? It means perhaps in your material ways or perhaps that you can flaunt you know with numbers to the world. Look, we have got this kind of we have got 10,000 members, 12,000 members. Yeah, sure. No, you don't. You have none you have the number of people that got calls. We don't ever we never know who this is. You might be having all kinds of people sitting around having well, just warming the seat, not even knowing why they're in the church, or because the family members in the church, or because oh it's a nice in the neighborhood, or because it's so lovely to be in the company of those lovely people. Oh, you name it, brethren, but those reasons are wrong. Because we're called, first of all, to further the gospel message. And secondly, to be prepared to rule in the world. And thirdly, after all, to be prepared for our own salvation by allowing the Holy Spirit to change us. You have people sitting in the church who are not different at all from the world. Do you think those people are God's people? No, I wouldn't say so. I wouldn't think so. So this obsession with numbers, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just so, so, so fed up with that. Oh, we are 22 congregations. Oh, how many of us have left our former church affiliation? And now, well, who cares? I don't care how many of you left. What I care is to know whether you're called by God or not. Oh, if this and such person and pastor will not be well, I will not be well. Who? That's your problem, not mine. That's not my problem. I'm not having problems with numbers at all. I don't care about numbers. And let all of you in Kenya and Africa especially understand that. I do not care about the numbers. I care about what you understand from God's word. That's what matters. And I care whether you are all called by God along with the rest of us, of course. I couldn't care less about the numbers. And you will never impress me with numbers like African leaders of our former affiliation tried to impress me with numbers. I'm not impressed with numbers. I don't care about numbers again. And I don't care that somebody wants to join us. You may want whatever. God is the one who joins people into his church. He is the one who says that no one can come to me unless, no one can come to true Christ unless God the Father draws him there. Period. But I'm absolutely amazed. I'm absolutely amazed with this constant, in my case, futile attempts of some people to impress me with numbers. Oh, we have such and such numbers in our congregation. So what? So what? What does that mean to God? <laughs> Nothing. Brethren, being called by God is what matters here. Not who wants to join us, who would love to join us. Fine, I don't, I don't, I'm not, I'm not against even those people who want to join us just because they enjoy our fellowship. That's okay. But we're speaking here about the fundamental things, brethren. We're call, speaking here about the work of God. We're speaking here about God working with people. So you see, 1 Corinthians 1, 26, 31. So things that are despised, things that are shameful, and so on. So literally then God picks those who are foolish, weak, and despised in the eyes of this world. That is, he does so. 
in order those who are saved are humble and do not take the credit themselves. He does it so all can see that if God is able to save the weak now, he must surely be able to save the strong later. Yes, indeed. And to be sure, God looks for other qualifications as well, such as the natural abilities he wants for certain future jobs and a willing attitude. So that's how we see uh, how Joseph and Moses and David and many others were used by God in accord, in, in accord with their natural abilities. And uh, they will fill places in his kingdom that will utilize the same abilities in the world tomorrow. Probably one of the most important questions asked by those who consider this topic is, am I being called by God? How do I know? Yes, and that's the number I want all of you in Africa to ask yourselves, and I want all of you around the world to ask yourselves, yes, am I called now being called by God, and how do I know? Well, if you go to John chapter 10, verse 1, uh, you may be able to find some interesting answers there. So John 10 here is John 10 and in verse 1 let's see verse 1 and we can be reading a few verses there verily verily I say unto you he that enters not by the door into the sheepfold but climbs up some other way the same is a thief and a robber but he that enters in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep to him the potter the porter opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leadeth them out. And when he puts forth his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of the strangers. This parable spoke Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spoke unto them. Then Jesus said unto them, verse 7, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door, I am the door of the sheep, and that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door by me, if any man enters in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives life for his sheep. But he that is uh, that is an hireling and not the shepherd whose own the sheep are not sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees and the wolf catches them and scatters the sheep. The hireling flees because he is an hireling and cares not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and I am known of mine. As the father knows me, even so know I the father and I lay down my life for the sheep and other sheep I have which are not of this fold that also I must bring and they shall hear my voice and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. This verse 60, brethren, believe it or not, refers to the ten lost tribes of Israel he was talking about here in the Jewish people, among here when he was addressing the Jewish people. How amazing! Verse 17, Therefore does my father love me, because I laid down my life, that I might take it again. No man take it from me, but I lay down of myself. I have power to lay down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment I have I received of my Father. There was a division, therefore again, among the Jews for these saints. He's talking to the Jews. And he mentions the lost sheep of the house of Israel as well in verse 16. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that wonderful? Verse 20, and many of them said, He has a devil and is mad. Why hear you him? Others said, These are not the words of him that has a devil. Can a devil open the eyes of the blind that he did? And it was at Jerusalem, the feast of the dedication, and it was winter. The feast of dedication, of course, is, you might remember, it's Hanukkah. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then came the Jews round about him and asked him, how long does you make us to doubt? If you are the Christ, the Messiah tells us plainly. <laughs> Jesus answered them, verse 25, I told you and you believed not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you believe not because you are not of my sheep 
as I said unto you, you're not of my sheep, brethren. That's the key thing. Not how many members do we have, not how many countries do we have, not how many thousands we have. Who cares about all of those thousands if they're not called by God and if they're not God's sheep? My sheep, verse 27, hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Forget about numbers. Forget about counting how many congregations we have in this country or that country. Forget about that. It's the calling of God that is now crucial for all of us. Especially you people in Africa, forget about it. Because you got used in our former affiliation that there are always fabulous flowery reports about so many congregations, so many people showing, uh, joining us, so many this and that. Who cares, I'm asking you. Who cares unless those people are being led by the Spirit of God? And we have seen that those leaders there are not led by the Spirit of God at all, but by the Spirit of the devil. They keep lying about us all the time. They keep making up things. And they ask, they, 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 they write us some, some, some detestable messages in which they see, see that they're boss. And amazing enough, their boss, instead of apologizing to, for those messages or telling them not to write, no, he just keeps quiet. Which means that he goes along with that. So sorry, I'm so sorry, so sad. I was seven years in faithful service to that person, brethren. Sacrificing my personal life and various other things for the work of God. To the end that I'm and some of my friends are experiencing being being you know being being lied about to that person and that person lying about us as well <laughs> and telling me and my friends that we cannot possibly we cannot possibly be a Philadelphian woman. Oh really? Oh really? Well let's God judge it. Let's God show it, brethren. But be assured, it will not be shown by the numbers. Oh, we have 12,000 members. We must be. No, not at all. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the God in Zechariah. So the might of humans, the might of numbers, the safety of numbers, it doesn't, doesn't matter to God. Not by might, nor by power. I, I think I'm quoting it correctly but that's something but it's about that not by my but by my spirit brethren it's the spirit at work that is crucial for the hope of israel worldwide church of god and so in these verses we read in john 10 christ likens the true believers to sheep with himself as the shepherd, he says, the true sheep will know their spiritual shepherd because they will hear his voice and understand his words. The point of the analogy is this. One whom God is calling will have his mind open to understand what he hears when he hears God's truth. One who is not being called may hear the words, but like a foreign language, he does not or she does not understand. Those words will not be mixed with understanding and belief. God calls then by opening one's mind to understand and believe the truth when he or she hears it. Has nothing to do with numbers. Has nothing to do with intelligence. Has to do with God's intervention in your life. Enough. And just, you know, don't try to convince me with numbers and by numbers. I don't care about numbers. What I care, I don't care about power and might of humans. I care about spirit at work. Are you being called is the question. You are if you are understanding and believing the truth. Such is the clear meaning of many verses, such as one that we read in John 10. There are also other verses like in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. In Acts chapter 28, verse 23 to 29. And Romans 11, 8 to 10. Let's go to Romans 11, 8 to 10. Are you being called? Well, Romans 11, 8 to 10. According as it is written, God has given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear after this day. As David said, let their table be made a snare and a trap 
and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their black always. What about Isaiah chapter 6? Let's go to Isaiah 6. And we'll see verse 9, I think. Isaiah 6. Well, 9 and 10 indeed. We're going to see verse 9. And he said, Go and tell these people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see you indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of these people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert and be healed. No, nobody can be converted, brethren, unless God calls him or her to conversion. And of course, once God has opened the mind of a person to understand spiritual knowledge, he must bring that person into contact with the truth so he or she may hear the call. So in conclusion, yes, it can be an enjoyable thing to be invited to a social gathering or a party, but it's joy unspeakable to be among the few now invited, called by God to fulfill the Great Commission and qualify for salvation and eternal life as children of God. So therefore, once again, please stop any of you. Stop any of you being obsessed with the numbers, number of congregations, number of this. God doesn't care. And keep in mind, it's somewhere in Zechariah, I'll find it later, but I know, I remember that whereas because very often it popped up in my life not by strength not by human strength nor by power nor by number I'll add nor by number of the congregations and congregants but by my spirit says not me says the Lord brethren Christianity and Christian life is a calling from God people cannot volunteer people cannot just come to be registered and be part of the church of their choice it doesn't work that way is God's calling. Keep that always in mind.